Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Creative Quarantine Sessions season finale. My name is Alexander Wittenberg, and I'll be your host for the next 90 minutes or so as we bring on a collection of friends and collaborators. Before we begin the show, I, of course, want to shout out, as always, to our technical director, the wizard behind the curtain, Alan Delinka. Thank you, Alan, for being here. And to our composer of the theme song, Mr. Nathan Avakian, based in New York. Nathan, hope you're staying safe and well, and thank you for that wonderful piece of music. So we're going to start things off. We have a lot to cover, and uh, we want to keep things moving along. So uh, in just a moment, we're going to bring on a friend of mine who is a, an artist in Bulgaria, Sofia, Bulgaria, Boryana Ilieva. And uh, she uh, is a cinephile, and she brings her love of film and her background in architecture to life in a series of, uh, of a collection of, of some incredible paintings that take a look at the houses from iconic films and explore their layout and um, the poetry of, of the house and the architecture and the relationship it has to its characters in the films. We'll bring her on in just a moment, but first I wanted to share um, a piece of mail that I received from her. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and bring this up here. So this is a, uh, a film card. Um, you too can also receive these film cards if you become a member of her Patreon, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I want to say specifically about this letter here that she wrote. Uh, I think this speaks a lot to the time we're in. Alexander, isn't it remarkable how I send you a card from one world and until it reaches you, the world has already drastically changed. This time I chose a film which tells a love story between humans and their house. But where will we be when this gets to you? I hope at a grand party. This, uh, she sent this March 16th, it arrived a few weeks later. But uh, what I loved about this was it uh, speaks to uh, the importance of the space we surround ourselves. Since we've all been quarantined in one space or another over the past few months, uh, I think it's really important to find a connection there. And Brianna certainly has. I also promised her that we're not really gonna spend much time talking about the uh, quarantine itself. There's too much of that talk going around. So we're gonna dive straight into our work. Please welcome from Bulgaria, Brianna. Hi. Hello. Good evening. It's now evening there. Yes, it's almost dawn. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite nice to have. You're our first European guest, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. Th this was a surprise with the letter. I wasn't uh, prepared. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, it was really such a nice letter, and it really did. It, it was. Um, it was such a comfort to have that, you know, during this time. So thank you for that. This was very nice. By the way, another one I sent today, so it shall come. Uh, it must come in a month or something, so you will read what I wrote. <laughs> oh, very good. I look forward to it. Um, I just wanted to give our viewers a quick background here of of how you and I met, and that is actually through um, a painting from Fences. Um, so I had been following your work on Instagram. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I was always kind of amazed by the work and you put up a bunch of originals and you said something along the lines of write a message of why this film means something to you. And I wrote to you about fences. 
And I was reminded uh, Fences was a favorite play of mine by August Wilson. My dad uh, bought me tickets to see the closing night Broadway production that my mentor Santo designed the set for. And this is a message from Santo that he wrote to me on, uh, you know, with, with an image of the set that he designed for that play. So this had always been a very personal piece to me. And then Denzel and much of the original cast went off to make the movie. And so you did, if I may share now, I have the original painting that you did of the Maxon household, uh, which is just incredible. And, and you know, for such, uh, such a personal connection to that film, it was really cool to bond over that. So that was the start of it all, right? All right. <laughs> it, it was, it wasn't, uh, I, I put uh, the paintings uh, on sale last year. During this time, can you imagine we're friends only We'll be friends only for one year. It feels like ten wow. years. <laughs> yes, absolutely, it does. And uh, yes, you you got you took this one, and you had this super personal story with it. I was very very touched and really really happy that it is going to be living in your home. Oh well, thank you. That's very nice. And uh, one more thing I'll say about uh, the friendship that we formed over the course of a year has been rooted a lot in films. Uh, and I really appreciate, as someone who stays up very late, I usually don't go to bed until like three in the morning, which yes. at that point I'm going to bed and you're waking up. Yeah. So I can always send you a message at that late hour and say, oh, I ju I've just seen this film and we can exchange thoughts about different movies. So I love that. I think it's, it's uh, one of the advantages to having, uh, to having us in different countries is I always know I can communicate with you about these movies at that hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm always available in the mornings. Yes. Not about dark films. <laughs> <laughs> There's no time for the happy films, right? No time for Wes Anderson. <laughs> there was time for Wes Anderson. I know you <laughs> found time. Wes Anderson <laughs> during the quarantine now. <laughs> the guilty pleasure, right? <laughs> it was the guilty pleasure, yes. <clears throat> well, I'd like to go ahead and bring some of the work up and um Maybe you can just walk us through your process of how you, um, you know, how you decide which films you're going to take on and, and what your relationship with these spaces is as you continue to kind of figure out what it is. So, uh, so this is first of all, just I want to welcome you in my portrait of a lady on fire uh, film set <laughs> I formed. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. We should definitely draw in, by the way, the space that you designed. Yes, I designed this. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. <laughs> if someone didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's terrific. I really do. I love the, the easel and the draped whatever it is back there. We may never know what we lies behind know. the curtain. We never know what's behind it, yes. So uh, <laughs> I will, I will uh, tell everyone that Alexander uh, signed me a task to pick three films, uh, which uh, I painted and which have the left impact on me and um, so I've been thinking and uh, I chose the three films which I will tell you more about and I don't have much time not only because I, <laughs> I have two people after me but I'm losing the light <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. the sun is getting down it's just like on a film set we can't lose the golden hour yes yes <laughs> it is and All right. The, the first title I would like to tell you more about is uh, Twin Peaks. All right, Alan, let's go ahead and bring up the images here. So we'll start with this here and we'll, we'll it's, work it's through the project. It's a good one for start. Uh -huh. uh, so just to let you know that uh, I've seen the film, the seasons and the full film uh, Twin Peaks Far Walk with me and the season three also several times. Uh, but the first time I saw Twin Peaks, it was when I was 10. Wow. And, yes, uh, because our country just uh, was coming out from a very dark ages of long uh, years of communism. And uh, we had uh, only one TV channel. Mm -hmm. and this TV channel was streaming at uh, prime evening time Twin Peaks every night. Our parents, they had no idea what uh, was uh, what we were seeing and we also had no idea what was going to hit our immature brains. Uh, so this was the first time I saw Twin Peaks. And uh, five, five years ago, 
I'm an architect, by the way. I don't know if Alexander mentioned it, but uh, I became an architect and five years ago, I decided to see the film again from the architect's point of view. And so this was going to be either about Laura Palmer's house or the Northern, the Great Northern Hotel where Agent Cooper had, uh, Cooper had his room. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't pick the hotel, but I am still, my mind still wanders around uh, his room these days because I'm uh, mostly doing hotel rooms uh, these quarantine days, hotel rooms film hotel rooms because uh, they give me more the feeling of freedom than the private uh, enclosed houses. So we never know about this room. So I, I started Laura Palmer's house and Twin Peaks was the, the film that t taught me the first lesson about production design. And the, this lesson was production designers cheat. Ah, yes, yes. I was trying to pull out the floor plan of the house of Laura Palmer and, and I was here, uh, right? Uh, this one, yes. And I was uh, scrolling to hundreds of screenshots I made uh, from the from the movie. And suddenly the living room, as it was on the right to the main entrance, jumped to the left of the main entrance, uh -huh. just like this. And I found out that David Lynch brought new house he changed houses just just like this from this wow. house, to that house and that's this here right uh yes these are the two houses i i i figured it out then uh when when i saw the living room moving so i had to pick a house and i picked house number one to deal with it and uh, dived straight into it and um, it was uh, I, I stepped into the deepest and dirtiest waters with the internal staircase <laughs> <laughs> because the staircase possessed a duality code which I couldn't crack. Laura Palmer is situated in the front in, inside the house in the front part of it uh -huh. and she steps and climbs and the stair to reach her room and then she goes back the same stair and appears in the back of the house and and my my architecture's brain couldn't figure out how how is this possible and uh, using the same stair and i couldn't figure it for a long time uh, and then i found out the, the geometry of the house and every, everything uh, after this clicked clicked normal. All the rooms, everything clicked as in a puzzle. And uh, since this moment, I have developed a strong relationship and respect towards staircases. Ah, because, very good. Uh, because we know directors uh, love staircases. For example, think of uh, Psycho by Hitchcock, the staircase in, in there in the house. So David Lynch, for sure, for sure loved his staircase and um, also the split of the staircase uh, in Laura Palmer's house uh, related a lot to the themes in the in the movie um, in like uh, doppelgangers mirror parallel words duality mm. I, I was I was very proud with this discovery of mine as and, you should be it's a very exciting discovery Yes, I was very excited and I felt like a winner because uh, it was uh, it was my my battle won. Yeah. <laughs> no one killed me. Wow. Uh, this, gray, this gray area, by the way, the camera, it is from the second floor and the camera never enters this place of the house, this part of the house. So we don't know what's in there, but I'm, I'm OK with the gray areas in my paintings. They, they show exactly how we the, the the viewers see the film absolutely we might call it the gray space right the the gray space yes <laughs> we're going to jump on to another project here in just a moment but i did want to bring up a question that we have here uh boryana's work is really inspiring and i want to ask her if she has studied architecture and how does she map spaces in movies and what inspires her well i think you touched a little bit on all that of course you yes you have studied architecture uh, yes, yes, I have worked as an architect for 10 years. I have had uh, project, projects completed and I have had spent enough time in architecture to get bored. 
Bye. <laughs> I see. And the second part of that question, which was how do you map these spaces in movies? I know that for you, a lot of that is reaching out to as many people as you can that had something to do with the film. But sometimes in the case of this next project, there's a basis in reality too, when you can actually find a space uh, in the world that informs your work, right? Right. Uh, in fact, I will answer the second part of the question right with this movie. Uh, this is uh, The Dreamers by Bernardo Bertolucci. It is um, a real apartment located in Paris. And it has this crazy shape, yes. Um, okay. this, is the second, this is the second film I chose to talk about because this film represents, again, a battle won by me after a bloodbath. This sheet of paper you are all seeing now, it had soaked with sweat, tears, <laughs> pencil over pencil over pencil over pencil. I, I abandoned this project uh, two times and one of the times I was absolutely sure it is an impossible task. And uh, maybe maybe the, the main reason for, for this sureness was uh, that um, I was very suspicious. I was sure that there was plenty of cheating in, uh, the, in montage here. Also, there is a, a very long corridor here. Alexander, you saw the film yesterday. You know which corridor I'm talking about. Oh, yes. There is a long corridor, and I, and I was very scared of corridors by this time because I learned. My experience taught me that uh, whenever there are such corridors, this might be some, they might be artificially added, and uh, probably the floor plan not being logical anymore. For example, Luca Godinino. He shot uh, this film, A Bigger Splash. It was right before Call Me By Your Name. And uh, there was a living space he shot in, and uh, it was kind of a dome. He added a corridor there, just like wow. this. And it it ruined all my chances to, to try to, to pull out a, a logical floor plan. So, yes, I was scared of corridors. Mm. Um, so, uh, to answer the second half of uh, the, this question, um, I have uh, several major resources of information. The first and most important resource of information is the film itself, the screenshots I take from it. Uh, the second one is Google Maps. Google Maps is the best friend of the architect. You can measure distances in Google Maps. Also, you can count you can count windows from the outside because the car the uh, the car passed around the, the building and you can you, you have street view. And there's a third third resource of information, which is the last one, uh, and this is uh, the production designer themselves. Uh, sometimes they have a website, and uh, sometimes you can uh, reach them and send them your soaked with um, sweat and tears paper showing all the dead ends you reached with their work. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Ask them for help. And maybe, maybe they can respond and maybe even they can become your friend. So at this, uh, at one certain stage of me trying to get the floor plan of this super complicated apartment mm -hmm. in the dreamers, I have used everything I could from the film and from Google Maps. So it, I, I had figured most of the plan, but there was this room of the American guest, his mm. guest room, and I couldn't figure out how how we are supposed to reach to this room in the in the plan. Right. So and we'll go ahead and, and get an overview here. I'm just going to jump ahead to this one so yes, we can see the room. Down, down over the over the yard, there is an inner yard full mm -hmm. of garbage in it, and below it down 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 yes this also more below even more below this is the room uh lower lower under the yard uh, this means south south not not north south oh, yeah. yes, yes 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 this is this is the room with the boxes okay this, yes this is the american guest room so he is he is somehow on this side of the inner yard, and they are watching through uh, through this through the windows of the inner yard uh, each other. 
our guys in the bathroom, which we can, which we can see if you zoom out. And this boy, yes. So I found the connection to the production design. I just wanted to ask him, what 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 is how how what happens here? <laughs> uh huh. And uh, and I wrote him a message, and uh, he never responded. By the way, the name of the production designer is Jean Rabas. He's a huge, huge person. He's uh, he has worked with um, Roman Polanski, with Bertolucci, with Pablo Lorraine, with um, mm, uh, Jean Pierre Jeunet, uh, and uh, he never answered. So I decided I'm doing this painting anyway, uh, and I'm just leaving this uh, American room floating in the air, not uh, not showing how how we reach. And it, it is an enormous painting, enormous. It took me four months. Oh, wow. okay. and, and there's an amazing amount of detail here as well, which is really exciting. It's like a scavenger hunt in itself to see all the pieces. Yes, probably that's the reason it took me four months. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, which you've done on a few projects, uh, where you highlight sort of uh, spaces in the house where certain moments of the film happen. Yes, it's the architect in me. I, I need order. <laughs> I need to, to, to have schemes. <laughs> right. And this really helps you to, uh, of course, understand the poetry of the space as well. Yes, I, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it's useful for, for people too. So I finished the painting and the production designer answers back. <laughs> he, he writes me a message and not only he writes me a message, but he sent me two, 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 two gigabytes with photos, material from uh, their work, from entering the empty, empty Paris apartment and reconstructing it and building it to look like this Paris bourgeois super detailed apartment. So wow. I'm not, Photos. This this was the most precious thing I have ever had in my life until this moment. I I, I looked at these paintings for days. I of course I sent him back the image of the painting and I sent him uh, also a paper copy of the painting. And do you know what he <laughs> said? What did he say? He told me that this is the first time that he sees this apartment as a floor plan from above from top view wow <laughs> they just they just broke through entered in the apartment fixed it made it months work and never never used the uh, image of, of a floor plan for, to do this oh man now can you imagine <laughs> if he had this before what a helpful tool it would have been i don't think it <laughs> have made it better uh, but i was i was very it was it was I was happy <laughs> to show That's so cool. <laughs> I love that. And I know that you've had the chance to interact with a lot of production designers over time, different projects, and uh, some uh, have really been very helpful in the process as well, as, as you mentioned with the photos for this one. But I know that that's like a constant um, pursuit of yours is to reach out to these people that have created these worlds that you find so inspiring and connect. I try, I try not to bother them um, until the moment that I, I cannot do it by myself. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to, I mean, I, I know that they're super busy and uh, just some girl writing them this, some letter asking for a floor plan. So this is the third, um, how to say, it, the, the third source of information which I don't always use. And when I have to use it, I don't always, I'm not always able to because sometimes they, they don't answer. I understand. But sometimes yeah. they answer. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, and that's they, always a good day. And that's a, that's a good day, yes. Yeah. Let's take a look at your third project, a film that I know uh, means a lot to me as well. This is Call Me By Your Name, amazing film. And also before we jump into your, your work on this, I did want to hold this up actually. Um, this is a color sheet. I called it Color Me By Your Name. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is, is your, name. <laughs> your yeah. name. And this is something that you started uh, at the beginning of the quarantine, give people a chance to pull out some colored pencils and actually 
from the line drawing that you created based on your research of the film, people could kind of make it their own, which was a really cool thing, by the way. Yes, thank you. I think it also worked well. Uh, I think a big part of Italy colored this, um, this scheme. Yes. Um, the film was shot in Italy. I mean, this, this film, I think this film means a lot to the whole world, but there's some special connection with Italian people. Ah, this, yeah. I mean, this is their, their director, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and so they, they, they just love it. But let's, let's say it. Uh, Call Me By Your Name was a movie which all the world celebrated. Oh, I agree. I, I've read stories, probably you too, about uh, people dancing in the streets after, seeing, uh, after coming out from the theaters and, and, so, and seeing this movie. I myself have a have a personal story with uh, uh, seeing it for the first time, and I believe uh, this this movie it uh, swept in a good way all the the loving and uh, and uh, sweet people all around the world, moviegoers, uh, and every every one of us will never forget the day that so called me by your name for the first time. Oh <laughs> what, yes. Call me by your name. What happened after call me by your name? <laughs> This a religious movie. experience, much yeah. like Portrait of a Lady on Fire from this year as well. Maybe, maybe. Uh, it, the Call Me By Your Name was, uh, was the stronger to me, but yes, I will remember the day of the Portrait of a Lady on Fire too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was on the first row. My heart was going to, 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 to come out of me on the last uh, three minutes scene with the Vivaldi I'm not telling you. Oh, I know, I know. It really is. That that moment is insane. I had the the uh, privilege of sitting in an empty theater when I saw that film for the third time. I sat there alone, and the final scene was just transcendental. But yeah. with this film as well, "Call Me by Your Name." I mean, like you said, this is one that'll stick with everyone who's seen it for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, sitting uh, inside the dark theater and watching it for the first time. And I was so fascinated by this bathroom, uh, which was the only way out for Elio. <laughs> the, and, and I was, whoa, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the bathroom is the only way out. I, I need to inspect this more. Uh -huh. and, uh, I went to see the film for a second time. Uh, it was on a film festival here in town and then I had only the trailer. I mean, you can. I, I could not have the, the film for months on DVD or just some some source. And I managed to to, to fix uh, a floor one of the two bedrooms. This one, uh, the the two bedrooms and the uh, bathroom from the my two viewings uh, of the film in in the theater, the trailer and a video. Some pervert guy. <laughs> Had uploaded on YouTube. He shot. He shot with his phone the scene, the blowjob scene. Oh yes, yes. And uploaded it on YouTube, and it stayed there for weeks. And this scene, it showed very well the connection between the two bed, <laughs> two bedrooms, <laughs> the door, and also this video helped me too. So wow. I almost managed to fix a uh, quite, um, quite. Uh, um, rightful uh, of Lord one i just missed one window <laughs> and a <wardrobe>. uh, <laughs> well i'd say that's pretty close uh, so. yeah, everything else everything else is close the, the other house it came months 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 later after the film came out on uh, dvd so i could, could have it at home uh but my my favorite thing about this project is uh all, all the people i got to talk to uh, and after I uploaded the image of the bedrooms on Instagram, uh -huh. I I just got the idea then how big the impact of this movie on the world is. It, I I posted something like this: "Hey, I made a mistake here. Can you find it? It was a missing window and the uh, wardrobe. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was a blast. <laughs> they were everybody was trying to." find what's missed, what's what's wrong, what's wrong. And uh, <laughs> so many people wrote from all around the world. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And a girl from uh, South Korea was, you missed a window. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 wow. Very cool. 
So let's, um, I, this is amazing. I, you know, here's the thing. I wish that I had all day to talk to you because these films, you always pick out such incredible details. Um, and you're getting a lot of comments, by the way. We have Christina from Serbia who says, what amazing work, wow. And Maggie uh, says, I love her work. So glad she is a guest today. Um, Karen Novak, who is a co-host on the show, asks, there are many production designers with the background in architecture. Is this leading you in that direction? So I guess the question is, no, is that no. something you've ever considered? <laughs> Everybody asks me this. I imagine they do. I, I somehow see this as me returning back to architectural kind of life, which I, at this moment, still don't want to go back to. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to, to do project after project after project after project very fast. And uh, uh, this, this won't allow me to move fast. I mean, you know, this, uh, the architectural work, I think the production designer should be the same designers who should be the same it takes time it's uh i i need to be faster in, in this moment i just i just feel like this so i just want to watch movies and to to, to do painting after painting after painting mm -hmm. <laughs> have so many films per year <laughs> yes now i um i'm afraid that we're almost at the end of our slot can you believe it's already been a half hour but no. I did want to ask you uh, to tell us about a project that you're working on now based on a Paul Schrader film that you saw the other day. You told me about it. I went and watched it on the Criterion channel. It blew my mind. Tell us about what you're working on. It's a discovery. I, I love when I have uh, discovered movies. Uh, it's a film I never heard about. It's from the 1990 and 1919, no, 1990. And this film um, made me think about it three days after this. Uh, and it's, this means it's a discovery uh, when, when I think so much about a film. It's shot in Venus and it's in a Venus Palazzo and the story is incredible, super. Mm. Um, um, it's, uh, th there's a lot of psychology in the story and uh, I want to, to do this Palazzo and uh, I, it's, probably going to be part of an exhibition, which is, uh, uh, I hope so, be uh, handled in London um, yes. in the end of this year. And the theme of the exhibition is films which are celebrating their 30th anniversary. 30th anniversary. So these are all movies shot in the 1990. And uh, this, the, I, 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 I picked this film. Wow. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yes, yeah. Everyone check it out. Everyone who has Criterion channel, go check out that film from, I think, like uh, 70. The Comfort of Strangers. The Comfort of Strangers, yes. Just listen, the music is from Angelo Bogdalamenti. The costume is uh, Armani, right? Yes, yes. And, um, and uh, it's uh, Ian, Ian, Ian uh, who, who wrote the book. I forgot. Oh, I'm afraid Ian. I don't remember it myself. But. McEwen, yes. But uh, it's it's an excellent excellent piece, um, Boriana. We have a lot of people tuning in that are really excited to see you. Um, we have somebody, Angel, who just said this is a very precious session as an architecture graduate who loves painting and film as well. I feel so inspired. I really look up to you. So I know that you made an impact in the worlds of of film and architecture and finding a really exciting way of bringing them together. This is actually my mother. Your work is so lovely. I hope that when the quarantine is over that you and Alex can collaborate in the future. Well, wouldn't that be fun? Um, who knows what I that hope. would look like? Yes, I, I hope, hope so too. But uh, I do want to, yes, shout out to your Instagram, which is where all of your work is kept. Uh, you can see the archives. Um, and then you also have your Patreon, which Patreon's a really, really great program to support artists whose work you believe in. Uh, Boriana has a Patreon where you can join uh, on a few different Come. levels of membership. Tell us about your Patreon real quick. What 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 can you expect from that? If you if you become a patron, you will probably be receiving film paper cards from me either every month or from time to time. It depends on uh, if you are a five dollar patron or twenty dollar patron. And it's big fun. 
receiving those paper cards in your mailbox. I also write there from time to time what I'm working on and you are most of the time first to know what's coming and uh, it's, it's, it's very friendly there and very personal and uh, I just love everyone there in the small film club, I call it like this. I love it, I love it. And we love it too, everyone is a member uh, I mean, we get a lot out of that. We really do. That just having a, a piece of snail mail, very exciting. And a mm -hmm. handwritten letter. Uh, and it accompanies the film. Um, as I say goodbye to you today, I just want to let you know uh, how much you've opened my eyes. As, as somebody who watches a lot of movies, I try to watch at least a movie a day. And um, your work has opened my eyes to look a little closer. And uh, it's very, very deeply inspiring. What you've what you've given us with your art. So thank you so much for that. I, I thank you. Yes, and uh, and be well. Hopefully down the line we might have a chance to have a longer session so we can dive a little deeper into some of your work. I hate to rush things the the way we are today. So we will. We will. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening there in Bulgaria. Thanks. Stay safe, and uh, we look forward to following your work and seeing what's next. Okay. Bye, bye, Boryana. Bye. All right, um, moving on from Boryana, the very inspiring artist, we'd like to move on to another very inspiring artist. He is a theatrical director, fight choreographer, educator, actor. We can go on and on and on about the amazing work and life of Mr. Tony Simotis. Please welcome Tony to the show. Hey. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Okay, good, good, good. That was an exciting uh uh, in, informative interview, and uh, uh, it was really just terrific. But looking at her artwork, just oh, isn't it? And I know you're a cinephile too, so so I'm sure yeah. it, it paints his films in a different light for you. Absolutely. So Tony, um, Tony's a, to give everyone a little background. Tony and I have collaborated on a number. Well, I guess only two. I can't believe it's only been two. I keep feeling like we've done more because we have so many ideas. <laughs> Because they were so difficult, it just seemed longer. Because <laughs> <laughs> working with you is such a pain in the ass. I, I, I tell you, forever working with you. <laughs> you bring over paper and you throw it away. Oh, my God. I actually have a picture of that paper we'll show in a minute. But Tony's yeah. a director um, at, uh, at a number of theaters. I'll let him give us a little background of his theatrical career in a moment. We have worked together in Orlando here at Mad Cow Theater on two productions. Uh, and we're going to dive into those and the, the collaboration between designer and director and how we sort of fed off each other. But first, Tony, why don't you tell us a little bit about your beginnings in theater and how you wound up here in Orlando? Oh, well, that's uh, uh, thank you, uh, Alex, for giving me just a space to kind of fill in a couple of the blanks. But uh, I did start off as an actor. That was my my primary goal in life. I never thought I would do anything else except act. I went to NYU uh, School of the Arts, and there I was fortunate uh, to meet a number of terrific artists, Tina Packer uh, and B.H. Uh, Berry, who became real mentors for me over the years. And then I became a founding member of Shakespeare and Company. And through that, um, I really, really kind of understood my, my way in the world as, a, as an artist. Uh, while I was at NYU, uh, the person who actually, uh, I would say, kicked me in the ass uh, was Olympia Dukakis, and she still today remains a great friend, and I've directed Olympia uh, a couple of times. But I never never imagined that I would do anything else other than look at scripts, uh, memorize, audition, and, and do projects. But I always found that there was something else driving me uh, when I was on stage, I was that annoying actor who always said, you know, wouldn't it be better if we moved over here? Couldn't we go over there? <laughs> so you were directing from day one in your own way. I right? know. And people, people said to me, said, you know, Tony, maybe you want to direct. And, uh, and so actually, I didn't jump in right away. It was actually because B.H. Berry, who was one of the foremost uh, 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 fight directors in the world, I became a friend and he was my mentor. Uh, 
Well, I, I started off in fight directing first because for somehow I always felt that, well, you had to be really educated to be a director. You had to know everything about the play. You had to, you know, whatever, every word meant you had to know everything. And you had to have read Nietzsche and Foucault. Yeah, and yeah. you know, you got to know everything. <laughs> you got to have books. You got to have at least eight, you know, binders of everything. And, and a um, pipe. <laughs> that's right, you have a pipe and, and, you know, patches on your arm and a turtleneck. So what I discovered, though, that was that uh, the fight was the way in, that I was actually able to see the production. And I saw it differently. And I saw movement differently. And... And a lot of my whole life came about because I, I started reflecting back and I went, well, when I was a kid, I was a catcher. I played, I was the catcher in baseball. And when I was, as a musician, I was the drummer. Mm -hmm. And I sat behind it and I watched it and listened to the rhythm. And so I realized that all these things were actually setting me up for being able to view a project from a particular point of view. And so... I started to actually become comfortable. And it was really, again, Olympia who said, Tony, direct from who you are. And so that's really what gave me the, the I guess, the, uh, uh, oh, the skill set or the belief in myself that I could actually take a production and see it to fruition and put my vision on stage. I didn't have to know everything that everybody else said about the play. It was how does it affect me? What does right. it mean to me in my life? And, yeah. and that really started to propel me to become comfortable with being able to say, I don't know. Being the actress, say, well, Tony, what, what, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know and because the, as, as Boreana said, that there were in her projects, it, that one that it took, she gave up on it twice before she came back to it and figured it out. And I think that each artist has to have the moment of going through the bad choices, right? Of looking at it going, I, I don't, I have no clue as to where I am, what's going on, but somehow I have to figure this out. And, and so like her work, it's like a puzzle that eventually gets put together. I think in a way, it's how I actually started to see theater and, and my life in the theater was the same way. It's a puzzle that became clear to me. So mm -hmm. when I met you, it was, uh, it was great because I felt like here was a designer that we actually created in the moment, much like you would with an actor. You know, when you're in the scene and you're working on something, it's like, hey, oh, that's good. I like that. Go back. Let's try, you know. And with you, it was, uh, it was the same thing, which was really remarkable was to a kind of kindred energy of, I'm not really sure, Tony, let me, let me think about that. And then five minutes later, you had, had an idea, or even in the moment, you had an idea of how to either solve it or, you know, what do you think about? So I guess that's kind of the background. What brought me here to Florida years ago was I left Shakespeare and Company. And, uh, and to be honest, my parents were, uh, were aging and uh, because of being an artist most of my life, uh, I never had a chance to really spend much time with my folks. And uh, they just passed away over the last year and a half. Mm. Uh, so it was nice to be able to uh, be here in Florida to be with them near the end of their life. And uh, it's really in this time uh, where we are today around the world has given me a uh, you know, even a greater appreciation for family and for wanting to to be with those that we love. So one day I look forward to uh, giving you a hug too. Oh, yeah. I know, me too. It is, it really is, you know, uh, sort of these periods of time where we have a chance to look back on, on and remember and meditate on, on these wonderful moments we've shared in the theater or at a restaurant having one of those larger than life drinks at a uh, Cheddar's, remember? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's always a wild time people. when we go out for dinner. But, I know. Um, yeah. I want to take a look at a, at a couple of the projects. Um, sure. So let's bring one of these up here. This is a great shot of you um, actually directing uh, Gemma and Brett in a play called Constellations. Oh, let's get rid of oh, that. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. And what's, what's really cool about this picture is 
I mean, this is just Tony at work, you know, and this is a space that we designed together for the play. Um, and I say designed together because this was really, uh, this we, we were one when we made this space, yeah. you know. This was really, that's a great picture. I, I, I've never seen this picture before. And um, normally when you see these things of, oh, look, he's directing. It looks like, what the hell are you doing? And, uh, but this was, it really shows a relationship between the, the three of us and obviously, you know, your work as well because you're in the room. And this was truly for me uh, a remarkable experience because we really did um, kind of put this together. And I don't know if the audience may, may not realize it, but Constellations uh, does not have, have anything written uh, with the material that gives you any indication as to where it is a stage directions, a setting, whatever. It just literally is a play, which is almost like a poem. And and it's like, good luck. I mean, it should say Constellations, subtitled, good luck. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it could be any number of things. And, and when I read it, um, I was really baffled. I went, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Because I was, I always liked uh, plays that really had seemingly had more movement or more conflict. And this play was almost like an acting exercise that we used to do at, at NYU uh, in terms of repetition. And where the line is said, and then the line is said, the line is said again, the line is said, the line is said again. And, you know, how do you make sense of that off the paper? Mm. And, uh, and so when, when you and I got together, after I you know, read the play a number of times, and I tried not to go to uh, what other people said about the play. I, I really kept wanting to just kind of be within it. And I remember when I said, I see the play like an art installation. And when I said that, it was like, we both started to click. And uh, that was the a kind of inspiration for the beauty of what you eventually brought. Uh, and what Eric Haugen, who did the lights, mm. and uh, <laughs> my foray with you in terms of the sound, uh, which was absolutely haunting. Oh and yeah, it really was. And and in fact, you know, we were we were also nominated for best uh, score, which was kind <laughs> of <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was kind of an unexpected treat at the end of a pretty mm -hmm. rocky road. I know, really. When it was like after nobody knows, but after tech, we went, okay, get rid of all the sound cues. <laughs> <laughs> Less is more. No, I, I, I was like, that sound design sucks. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> holy shit, what were we thinking of? Yeah, and, and then, then it's Sentinel the next week or whatever. It's, oh, you know, best sound design. <laughs> what? Okay, go home and erase everything. <laughs> So let's take a look. I have a picture here, Alan, if we could bring it up. This is a piece of paper, okay? And this is a paper that I brought to you to your house when we were first talking about what this is going to be. And so this is like a piece of craft paper that I did maybe, I spent five minutes that morning pouring some paint on it and spattering it on to, cr to try and create this sort of cosmic landscape. Well, that's when um, you do your best work, when you just take five minutes. <laughs> 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 Who needs prep? You just need five minutes and a sheet That's of paper. Five minutes. That's it. Oh, uh, so, yeah. I remember, you know, when you when you were sitting at the kitchen table and you brought that in and you put it down and I just went, okay, either he's nuts <laughs> yeah, right. or, uh, or it's brilliant. <laughs> and, uh, and then I just, when we talked about let's cover the walls, I was like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding but it sounded so exciting. And the uh, whole theater walls, everything was covered with that uh, paper that you painted with Liza and Liza Burke. And here she I is, noticed, here's Liza, it, by the way. Here she is. Our I mean, artist. It, it was absolutely stunning, just stunning. And it certainly, Eric's lighting really painted it in a beautiful light too with these chair mm -hmm. rail, this light that ran across the back of the heads of the audience. So it up lighting that changed. And then we had these um, 
we had these 60 incandescent bulbs that that would kind of flicker and create different multiverses within the within the world of this play which is really special you know That's right just, I, I love the fact that you know from that early inspiration of that piece of paper um you know the floor really became uh, a, a really a, a view into the universe. I mean, imagining being in a spaceship and really truly looking out a window. I mean, today, you know, in a few hours, if all goes well, the SpaceX capsule will take off from Cape Canaveral close by here. Where Very I exciting. Now. Very exciting. And so, you know, that was really something is that you walked into space, you know, the the act of creativity is one of standing in the unknown. Mm. And I've always believed that, that, you know, that's why when, when I deal with artists who seem to know everything, they know where they're going, they pleat, block, block the show, that, you know, when you have to do everything months in advance, it's like, well, I don't even know where I'm going to be, you know, right. in six months. I don't know how I'm going to feel. And it that's what was so immediate about the work is that, we were dealing with truly the sense of almost like what you said earlier, that five minutes that it took you to, to create it. We were always in that five minutes. Where are we? How do we, how do we start? How do we end? Where are we going? And that tension is really what helped to generate, I think, a daring, a daring choice. Mm. Uh, and it actually for the actors as well, because you know what the audience didn't know and i i didn't even know how to start the show because there's no there's no nothing written by the author the playwright that says when the show opens this is what you see it gives right. you nothing nothing and we actually started it with one of the actors sitting in the audience as a as a patron and and so she jumps up on the chair and starts speaking and the audience you know people were like what what the hell's going on? And uh, and that surprise was exactly how I felt about the play. It was a constant surprise. You didn't know where it was going to go, how it was going to end. And emotionally for them, they were actually husband and wife, and I didn't even know it when I cast them. So uh, that was uh, really amazing because I really pushed that couple, uh, Gemma and Brett, to places I don't think as a couple they had really experienced because it really deals with the death of of the wife or the, the female energy so um that's a lot to take on for a couple to actually face them it is it is and the fact that you didn't know that's really unique and and really uh yeah uh, I know. A, a kind of a once in a lifetime experience to work with with the couple yeah. in that way i mean you were essentially a therapist through it all you know <laughs> yeah, there were uh, there were some definite uh, discussions that were very hard. Now, and I'm I'm a cancer survivor myself. This is actually right now, uh, in June I'll be it'll be ten years, and I could and I know that having throat cancer and all the other things that have gone on in my life, it's beat the shit up. And I hope I don't know if you have to believe that word out, but all I can tell you is it's really beat me up, mm -hmm. and. Um, and recently I've seen pictures of myself as a young man and I'm going, wow, Tony, man, <laughs> you've really aged, man. And it's like, well, you know, cancer will do that to you. And in this situation with Brett and Gemma, you know, there was something I could bring to them with because of my experience of chemo and radiation and surgeries and any number of procedures uh, just to, you know, discuss and and talk about the challenges of of what's that what's that like, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was, uh, you know, all in all, it was a, an incredibly moving experience. And you gave us the space to be able to really create that. I mean, you know, a lot of times, as a director, I found that it's the designer who has a particular eye that really helps to understand the play in a logical sense. You know, like what she was talking about was the order. Remember, uh, architectural order, you right. know, of right. how she sees the world. And in a way, because 
the emotional world uh, and the psychological world of the actor is so sometimes undefined. You, I find personally, I need a structure around me that gives me a place to understand where I am. Mm. And that's what you did. Even though it seemed endless and and the feeling was that we could be in the infinity of the universe, even that though still says this is the universe you are in, right? You're not just completely floating. Right. And so the architecture of the space really helped me to understand where I was. And the simplicity of the of the couple of boxes that we use, the actor cubes that were painted then with, with that beautiful effect uh, and the circle, that simple circle on the floor mm. that reminded us of, of the complexity of, of our own planet uh, and the circle is a sacred, uh, it, you know, um, uh, it's just a, a sacred structure. And right. so it was really, there was so much there that the audience could never take in in one viewing. So, well, you know, I, I want to speak real quick to the circle because the circle was a big, big piece for us here. And I don't really know where the circle came from. I think you and I just sort of felt the impulse that we needed to have one there. We needed to have in the center. We knew we needed to have like a, a, a place that grounded the, the space. Yeah. And do you remember at a, at a talk back, somebody from the audience asked the question, what does the circle mean? And we threw it back to the audience member and said, well, what does a circle mean to you? That's right. And this, this audience member then went off for a few minutes explaining, well, I believe the circle is sort of their own universe in, in a very vast multiverse and on and on and on and on. And it's like, well, clearly this audience member who just asked us what it meant knew what it meant. And that's, that's right. all that matters is that these people mm -hmm. would leave the theater and they, they have their own experience that is completely and uniquely theirs. And right. for that person to have said, this is what the circle means, that is uh, the power of theater, right? Well, go, go back to the, I mean, it's right from the very beginning, the ancient Greeks with the orchestra, and then, you know, up into the Elizabethan time and the globe where mm -hmm. the circle became, <clears throat> excuse me, within this, you know, golden uh, orb. You know, it's just the circle has has been uh, a powerful symbol in in what our uh, represents our humanity, as as well as the creative energy that it has inspired, you know, for century upon century. Yeah. And so it just felt right that subtly uh, it was there on the floor. Remember, it got painted too thick at one point. It was covered oh, it in, did. and it had to be. We thought, what are we going to do? I know. <laughs> like, oh my God, who painted the floor? <laughs> you know? And. Uh, but we fixed that, so it all yeah. worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what is it that you expect when you start a project? Obviously, every designer-director relationship is different. Um, before you know who your designer is, when you're going in for that first meeting to sit down, uh, for the sake of this conversation, let's say, the set designer, uh, what is it that you expect out of that relationship before you even had a chance to meet the person? I think the there's something about how they see the play, you know how it how the play has impacted them, you know um, it's uh, you know I know we had talked you know before the other day about uh, hand to God, and and you know I've had the good fortune to, to working here in Orlando to work with some ex incredible designers, uh, not only at Mad Cow Theater but also at Orlando Shakes. And the, I'm gonna, but I want to find out how the, the play uh, has impacted them. How does it you know, reverberate in their life? Because, you know, it, like in, in, in anything we stage on stage, that the blocking will always, in a way, take care of itself on some level, right? right. When we know the story, when we know what we're trying to say, you know, with the, with the individual scene. So to me at first, I just want to find out how they view it. I mean, is this a job? Is it just a job? Or was there something particular about this play? You know, like in Fences that we were talking about earlier. You know, what was it about that yard, about the feeling of the yard, 
uh, and and what what we want to see with the tree, you know, that that Troy and the ball hits, you know, what is it? What what are the images for them that inspired them to 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 kind of you know look at the research? Because that's what I've always been. I found fascinating with designers is the research they bring in, the images. Because I again, you know. It's one thing to read an article about something. It's another thing to actually see the image and right, right. the things that inspire you. I always come back to this with it, you know. It's like, okay, a theater is like a cookbook. If you're looking at the book, right, of the food, it looks interesting, right? <laughs> well, what does it taste like? <laughs> what right. does it taste like? You mm. could do the research and show me a cool picture of it, but what does it feel like? to be in the environment of that, you know? And so that's what, what we have to do. And I want to find out, you know, can we cook together literally? Uh, you know, how do we, how, how do we, you know, how do we touch the world? How do we massage the world? How do we fight the world? You know, when it bangs us, you know, can we get up again and, and, uh, and get to our feet? What, what does this world mean? And, so I, I love that when a designer comes in and has been inspired by the play in some way. And, you know, you're easy. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're an inspiring guy. You're full of ideas. And that's what makes, makes it good for me. Well, you are as well. I, you are a director who knows what to say. You have something to say. And, I mean, that's all any of us can ask for is to have something to say, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we keep coming back in always and trying to redefine what theater is and, you know, or why we do it, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I keep coming back to this idea that, you know, uh, and because, you know, just so your audience knows, Tony Samotis is Andoni Asomomitis, I would be Greek. And, and I always keep coming back to the ancient Greeks, Theatros. It means the place where the gods are seen and revealed. I mean, theater wasn't just an entertainment. You know, there was the Seder plays and all the other the certain things that took place that was to kind of relieve the the anxiety and the depression of some of the, the tragedies that were being done. But the theater was literally a living art and history and philosophy and religion of the people themselves. So it wasn't like someone said, hey, let's put together, let's get a piece of, of space and we'll invite 15,000 people and, and, you know, we'll... Uh, and we'll do a play. No, it's like that was born literally out of the need to discover our humanity and mm. to figure out what we are. And so to me, that's what I that's why I do it. I, I I don't want to leave this world without asking the question, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? What do you want? And uh, and so, you know, that to me is what what theater and art should really be about, of constantly challenging us to, to figure out, you know, what is in our soul, what is in, rolls around with us. And so your job as the designer is to somehow create the space. Right. I'll put in, I'll put that other life out there, but without the space, that life can't live. Mm. You know, so maybe that's my book. Without the space, the life can't live. You there know. you go. What a and book. You know, because that's the uh, that's what the designer does. Here's the floor. Or here's the no floor. Here's the wall or the no wall. And uh, I know your other guests coming on talking about light. You know, that that really is. I mean, that's what it's about. How we see it. How it's perceived. How those pixels move us. You know, right. and how light transforms us. You know, and the Greeks used the sun yeah. and the Elizabethans used the sun and candles. And eventually, you know, we developed all the other things from gaslight to electricity to whatever we're doing now, but still it's about seeing. And yeah. so, and it really was, as you just said, at the decline of the aristocracy is that moment when the audience and actor relationship changed because all of a sudden the actors were lit on stage and the audience were sitting in the darkness in a separate mm -hmm. space, right? Instead of everyone being unified with the same light from above. 
So right. at that point in time, I would say that the uh, theatrical experience, what it meant to attend a play, uh, changed dramatically. And I would say we're at a point right now where it's going to change again. And yeah. I hope that um, we take this opportunity on an optimistic level to um, to look at uh, new frontiers and how can we redefine the theatrical experience to maybe bring us back all to the same light, the actors and the audience. Okay, so here's the well, one thing too is that now you know I'm I'm a little older as as Olympia used to say to me. She said, "Tony, I'm just a little farther down the road than you," and and that's really the truth. I mean, we we know we're in a, an unusual time and space. But the reality is, what has driven us since the time of, of those ancient theaters has been the sense of human gathering. Yeah. That is built into our DNA. There's a reason why people flocked to the beaches and did things that were, you know, probably uh, uh, ill advised. But there is something in us that demands that we share in this communal experience. And the theater cannot lose that. I mean, I mean, what you're seeing in some of the, the programs on television now that are doing their from home shows is you actually see them as people. I mean, watching Jimmy Fallon at night walk down the road with his wife and his kids in there in the room while he's doing the Tonight Show. It's like I never particularly liked Jimmy Fallon. But after watching the in home version, it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. It allows uh -huh. me to to experience his humanity and wh where he comes from in a way that allows me to understand. And in the understanding is what we're, we're failing at so miserably right now, you know, the listening and the understanding of each other. So Alex, I don't want to see us lose what has kind of brought us to the party. You know, I know that for a while we're going to, you know, be a little, it'll be a little chaotic. But I'll do everything in my power to get, if it needs to be an outdoor performance, then let's sit outdoors. You know, let's yes. do the play outside. Everybody can be in their apartment across the street and watch the play outside if they need to. But yes. however, you know, we, we're going to need to come back to where we were because it's too important. Too and important. we will. We will. I believe we will. I and, love you, Tony, and I thank yeah. you for being here. This is, uh, I, again, I wish we could talk all day. I really do. Um, but, but everything that, that you've said today is, is poetic and truthful, and, and it speaks to who you are as a person and an artist. And uh, I couldn't be happier to have you as, as somebody that I look up to in my life. So thank you. Well, I look forward to the next project that, uh, that we could do together. And uh, it's... It's been a, a remarkable journey so far. And, and of course, I wish everybody out there uh, good health and safety and that uh, we are able to, as a, as a people around the globe, uh, find a way to uh, feel safe and secure as we can move around again and find these places to, to create and make the art that we envision. So, yes. Thanks for the opportunity today. It was great. It was a lot of fun. And I would have swore more, but I don't know how you bleep this stuff out. So. <laughs> hey, yeah. we, we let it fly here on the internet, okay. as Alan, mm -hmm. our technical director, says. Thanks. Okay, good. Well, then, you know, it's been a blast, man. And I wouldn't yeah. say anything more than... Uh, you should just say, it's been a fucking blast. It's been a fucking pleasure. It has been. <laughs> so, uh, and my puppies in the background have been very good. I didn't have any... Fucking festy. Yeah, they yeah they're fine. They're really good. They're they've been. It's a kind of gloomy day here in the Orlando area, so it's kind of put everybody a little bit at, at ease. So yeah. that's been good. Cool. Listen, love to you and your audience, and uh, thanks for inviting me on this. Thank you, thank you. Talk to you soon. All right, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, for those of you still with us, thank you for hanging in there. We have another very special guest who's been waiting in his uh, Manhattan studio to join us. Please welcome to the stage lighting designer and creative director, Mr. Brian Tovar. Hey, Brian, how's it going? How's it going? Good, good, good. You having a good day in, in New York? I am. It's, it's sunny. It's beautiful. I'm stuck inside. 
uh, like many of us. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to continue the swearing party. And uh, <laughs> very yeah, good, very uh, good. A little bit. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes, absolutely. More. So uh, Brian and I met at a party in Harlem a number of years ago. <laughs> um, Which one? It was at it was at Clark Gazer's apartment. Yeah. Um, we uh, united over uh, shared frustration with a particular person uh, <laughs> who will not be brought up today. And, um, and we built a friendship that turned into a creative partnership. We've been working for quite a while now, maybe four years on a project. Um, yeah. And, uh, and it's been really great. Back, back before this uh, quarantine thing happened, we would take frequent trips back and forth to New York and Orlando and uh, have little weekend retreats to work on, on that project that hopefully will, um, will come to fruition in the near future. Um, but tell us a little bit, as, as we scan through some of your, your work here, tell us a little bit about uh, what it is that brought you to New York to pursue lighting and how that eventually turned into something much bigger with your experiential work. Oh, uh, well, oh, that's great. Um, first things first, Alex, I, I think that every um, creative initial conversation and collaboration should uh, begin with a a drink and a toast. Absolutely. Uh, as as we've shared many 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 drinks and many <laughs> many cocktails. Um, so cheers to you and cheers to everyone um, watching. I feel it's the best way to have a conversation. It is. It is. <laughs> so, uh, New York City. Um, I grew up in Texas, um, uh, in San Antonio, and actually. Unlike many of my collaborators and friends, um, not around much theater, much um, uh, art, really. So it, it wasn't until I left Texas where I really um, uh, got into uh, the art scene and learned what musical theater was and theater in general. Um, everything before that was essentially just um, great food and, and, and having a good time and, and uh, fiesta and um, but you know I think something something inside of me sort of brought me to, to New York City and, and I, I think just to, to want um, some art in my life. So um, I did make it out of Texas um, into New York City and it's been about 12 years that I've been here. Wow um, and primarily, uh, theater based for a good amount of that. Um, and you know, that's how I made it. That's how I made it here. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and now you are the co-founder of a, uh, of a creative group called live Sight. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my theater, uh, background sort of brought me into the world of, of, of live events, um, specific to brands, um, and that was a, a transition that was that was pretty easy to incorporate into uh, my career here, um, because it's all about creating worlds. Um, like Tony mentioned, um, you know, it's space, and and light is space, and set design is space, and and costumes is space. It's what you put in an actor's is space. Um, so you know, the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of your first projects uh, that that you really had the opportunity to experience or or play with light in space and how light can redefine a space was uh, Twenty Nine Rooms, right? Um, that was sort of that. That was in two thousand fifteen, um, and uh, it was when I started to when I moved into creating the. Um, immersive experience, experiential world. Um, and that was, that, was, that was quite a task. It was 29 rooms um, and it was the first of its kind that um, ever existed. And you know, none of the collaborators really knew how um, the audience or the guests or the, the public were going to react and it became a phenomenon. And, wow. 
that eventually grew into um, what experiential is now in regards to um, uh, incorporating social media and um, incorporating uh, the uh, technology and and uh, younger demographics and essentially bringing um, the uh, internet to life. Yeah. So that was sort of, and same thing with the Museum of Ice Cream, um, you know, bringing those worlds that you see on the digital screen um, on your iPhone, on your computer, um, to a real experience, similar to what we do in theater with with plays and with scripts, we we take that and then we then we put it on onto a stage and experience it that way. Yeah. So I should say, because um, you you sort of corrected me there, which I appreciate you doing. Uh, of course, you had been lighting for theater quite a while before you jumped into the into the experiential realm with Twenty Nine Rooms, um, but that did in a way reinvent the way that you saw space and and light in that space. Uh, it, yeah, it did. In, in you know, in in theater, um, my work. Uh, I I did go to school for a short amount of time. I dropped out, then I went part time. Eventually, got my degree after <laughs> hustling a few people, um, <laughs> or a lot. And uh, but I never designed in an educational setting. Um, I never designed. I was never allowed to or asked to, and that was fine with me because it just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, so a lot, my, the way I learned to design was off, off, off Broadway um, for a hundred dollars, $500, um, not a lot of lights, driving to go pick up your lights um, across New Jersey and really making your own, um, way of doing it um uh in addition to having a few um mentors along the way in the first couple of years um i learned by by doing it and uh hanging lights in in places where you uh, where there wasn't a lighting position making your own lighting positions i often had to do that lighting things in unconventional theaters when you have no budget and you try to do a show in a studio downtown in soho um, you have to make the places where lights hang. Um, you have to find different ways. You have to incorporate architectural lighting. And that was the foundation of the way I approach my work now and the way I approached um, um, starting to do event design and experiential design and whatnot is that you, you, um, you have to think about space um, backwards. Um, you have to look outside the box because sometimes you don't have the tools inside the box to make what you want. Mm, that's for sure. Yeah. So um, that was that was uh, uh, that was how my approach to to theater and approach to design was um, was crafted. Right on. Um, I want to focus on one project in particular. Um, and I remember we were at the Soho House in uh, in Dumbo when you were telling me about this. You said, you know, I have this really great idea, but I can't tell you about it yet. I'm like, okay, well, how many drinks is it going to take to pull the idea out of you? And that <laughs> that day, I think on the sunroof of this uh, of this club in in Brooklyn, we ended up having like eleven drinks each or so. You know, it was like an absurd amount of cocktails in a rather short amount of time. And finally, you told me about the idea that became Human's Best Friend, and we can see an image of it now. Um, this is a really, really cool project on many levels. For you, uh, in this project, and like many other of your experiential projects, uh, lighting was only a small piece of the puzzle for you to figure out, because you're also the creative director. So can you speak to how Human's Best Friend came uh, to be and what it's, what mission it served in the in New York City? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, my great friend and collaborator uh, and business partner, Jason, um, and I came up with the idea to, to essentially create our own thing. Um, so often um, as designers, you, you have to, you, 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 you know, you, you work with the script, you work with the director and the producers and, and or the brand, and you're often told 
what to make um, and oftentimes how to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are beholden to that. Um, so we decided that we wanted to make our own thing. We wanted to um, be the people that, that, that decided uh, that didn't have to answer to a brand or a producer um, and we could just make our own project. Um, it did involve dogs and it did involve the uh, idea of a, a pop-up and social media. And, uh, you know, we sort of put all of our favorite things together and, um, and made Humans Best Friend. And it didn't have a lot of lighting in it. Uh, I actually relied a lot on uh, my core team um, to help me make it in regards to lighting and beyond. Um, but it was really uh, our first, my first stab at uh, conception, conceiving of something, not conception, conceiving of something, um, <laughs> conception of an idea. A conception uh, idea, yes. <laughs> a birth, if you will, a birth of, of something that was just, um, in my head, having been part of um, uh, 29 Rooms and Museum of Ice Cream and uh, a handful of other things is, you know, was that. And uh, you came to help out for a few days and I, it, I was greatly appreciated. Greatly oh, appreciated. it was great fun. It really was. And, <laughs> um, and to serve such a powerful mission too of, of getting pets into the homes of, of people. Uh, I mean, really great work. And I and the idea of, of humans best friend, uh, a very progressive, forward thinking concept, um, and as simple an idea as that may seem, just simply rephrasing the term from man's best friend to human's best friend is yeah. a big yeah. deal. A big yeah. deal. One of the one of the um, one of the most interesting things that you know only only people who maybe typed it in uh, know. Um, is when you did type in uh, human's best friend into Google, Google initially um, auto-corrected it to man's best friend. And um, from that came hundreds of pages of, of man's best friend, man's best friend, man's best friend. Um, and and, and, and it, you wouldn't even get anything that said human's best friend or girl's best friend or baby's best friend or you know, um, dad's best friend, mom's best friend, uh, they's best friend, um, it auto-corrected to man's best friend. And uh, we launched this thing in 2018 and it doesn't happen anymore. Amazing. Friend is now a thing. And, and, and I did not understand why uh, in, this, in this day, um, people can still refer to dogs as man's best friend. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this speaks to the power that you have as an artist. And I often think about the responsibility of an artist. What is, what is our job uh, in the world? What purpose do we serve? What higher purpose? Of course, our job is to design and create theatrical spaces and blah, blah, blah. But what is a bigger picture? And one of the projects that really illustrates um, how this art can take on an almost noble pursuit is the work you've done with New York City and the Arch. Uh, we have some images here. Tell us about how this partnership began and we'll scan through some of the um, transformations you made at this very iconic Washington Square Park Arch. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it all started back uh, in uh, uh, when the Paris terrorist attacks happened um, and I got a phone call uh, I got a text from a director that I worked with who has a relationship with the city and uh, followed up by a phone call um, asking to uh, come in and, and, and help create a piece of art uh, that day. Um, and, and they had a few ideas to light up a few monuments. Um, and uh, they hopped on a phone call uh, that morning, the day after the, the terrorist attacks, which was a, a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to um, uh, experience um, from afar as, as, a, as, a, as a New Yorker um, to um, our friends in um, uh, Paris. Um, and so, so the next day, so the next day after the attacks, we got, I got a phone call and 
I said, sure, absolutely. So, you know, an hour later, I was on a conference call with the mayor's office and everyone there. And then uh, an hour after that, we were on site at, at the um, at the Arch. And uh, I said, let's do it. So we, we collaborated with a vendor. We got the equipment delivered um, by police squad, which has now happened to me maybe three times. Um, and uh, and we lit up the arch uh, to pay respects to our, our friends um, in uh, Paris. That's uh, amazing. And then you, you, you got to work on a couple other uh, wonderful moments in New York yeah. history as well. This is um, this was uh, this past summer, uh, World Pride. Um, we lit up the arch in uh, rainbow pattern. And uh, that was quite amazing because 7 million people came to New York City for World, World Pride. And uh, little did we know uh, that 10,000 people would um, march through this on wow. the second day. I was there with my um, uh, uh, good good friend and, and uh, associate, um, John. And uh, out of nowhere, 10,000 10, people came through. And all of a sudden, we were surrounded by ten thousand people, and to, and and to experience that was crazy. It was crazy. It was to, it was so powerful. But I'll tell you this: those ten thousand people moved through the arch. They came down uh, Fifth Avenue through the arch, and then they spread out throughout um, Washington Square Park, and um, they had no idea that at sundown or near sundown that the archer would light up. Wow. No idea. So uh, we get to the, the perfect point in, in, um, in sort of daylight, getting into nighttime, and uh, uh, we say, okay, uh, go. We press the go button. <laughs> all of a sudden, the arch lights up in rainbow colors. Wow. And we hear an audible gasp. We surprised uh, thousands and thousands of people by doing this, by lighting up the arch and, and, and creating this, essentially this gesture that, that, that used light to, to, to paint it in a way that um, was symbolic to, um, to a, a group of people um, and symbolic to you know, the world, essentially. And, and humans and, um, and to hear <gasps> that by thousands of people was, it was powerful, it was powerful. That's incredible, it really is. I have goosebumps just hearing the story. <laughs> uh, Brian, you, you're a Drama Desk nominated designer. We could go through all of your theater work. We could go through all of your experiential work. Um, of course, we don't have the time today, but I do want to ask you, uh, as you continue to uh, move forward in an ever-changing creative landscape, what is your hope for the future? My hope for the future? Um, I, I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of doing things in, in unconventional ways. Uh, experiential is in, inherently um, you know, unconventional. It's it's experiential. It's 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 trying trying things out, and um, often I find myself um, uh, frustrated with um, uh, the lack of um, um, uh, breaking boundaries in in theater, and the things that I I love the most are uh, experiencing. Uh, Things in different ways, and experiencing um, theater, uh, theater and beyond in unconventional ways, and in, in ways that I, I never thought of, um, or an audience never thought of, um, and more often than not, uh, conventional theater is not exciting. And I think that um, um, I think that if we can find a way to experience um, art and experience theater in different ways, and unfortunately this is doing it, um, I think it's gonna be great for, for everyone. Um, you know, breaking boundaries, um, 
uh, finding out, finding different ways for audiences to experience uh, a story um, in the event world and in the brand world and experiential. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's going to lean a lot towards um, digital and um, experience and using technology to um, experience uh, things. And, you know, theater will, theater will be behind that. Um, and hopefully the two can work together and, and, um, and, you know, I often bring the theatrical craft to uh, my event work. And that's, mm -hmm. that's often why um, I have people like working uh, with me and, and, and my team, because we are artists, we are theater makers, we are um, uh, crafters of, of uh, light and uh, set and physical things, um, you know, we think out the box, outside the box, and I think that that is um, that is the way. Hopefully, that um, producers and and companies can um, start to think about. It's exciting. It rip, is. rip out half the seats in the theater and let's see what happens. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I mean, that excites me absolutely. Let me put some lighting positions in places where their seats used to be. Sign me up, I'll do that. That's exciting work for me. That's exciting work for everyone. Let's see something different. And yeah. hopefully that, that becomes, um, I would certainly do that if I was a theater company. Right on. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Brian. I cherish your friendship. I cherish our collaboration. Uh, can't wait to um, be in the same room with you again soon uh, to brainstorm the next great idea. And <laughs> until then, sending you lots of love and thank you for taking the time today to be with us. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> See you soon. All right. So everyone, this with that, uh, we, we bring this round of the creative quarantine sessions to a close. Uh, I hope that you all got something out of these past 10 episodes. Um, the many special guests that we've taken the time to speak to, everyone is contributing something really special to, to our world. Um, and, and they're bringing art and creativity, which is what we need now more than ever to get us through. So um, at this time, the future of, of how these programs might continue is unknown, as my place of work just uh, announced their reopening, which is about a month away. Over the next month, I know I will do my part to, um, to do what I can as an artist to, to make the world a better place. And I hope that all of you watching will do the same. I'm sending you all lots of love, comfort, help. Uh, be well and, uh, you know, maybe we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.